unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. On Sunday, votes were finally tallied in four states which went for elections this past month, the last test parties and candidates will face before the general elections in April and May of next year. After much anticipation, counting day left very little to the imagination. In a big setback for the Congress party and the opposition alliance more broadly, the BJP won decisive elections in three big Hindi Belt states, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. The lone Congress victory came in the southern state of Telangana, where it displaced the once-dominant regional party, the BRS of K.C. Rao. To discuss these results and what they tell us about the race for 2024, I'm pleased to welcome back to the podcast two of our colleagues from the Hindustan Times. Sunetra Choudhury is HT's political editor, and the Bunker Ghost serves as HT's deputy national editor. We're talking today in the Hindustan Times studio in New Delhi. Guys, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having us. Thanks, madam. So, Sunetra, let me start with you. Kind of big, big picture, 30,000-foot question. What, in your mind, are the key takeaways or the lessons from these elections, if you had to kind of summarize them for, you know, a global audience? You know, um, uh, there are so many, but I'm just going to go with one very generic one. And it sounds really basic and it sounds like something that the Congress should know uh, or any team should know, but they just don't get it which is never underestimate your enemy. And the reason why I say, and it's not a political thing, but I I mean, it's the most obvious thing that you can see in two states, which looks like Congress handed on a platter to the BJP. Let's start with the Madhya Pradesh one. Madhya Pradesh, obviously, 18 years of anti-incumbency. Over there, you had also someone which the BJP's own uh, survey said that the chief minister had fatigue among the voters, uh, that the issues, people just wanted something different in news. That's what you started off with. And Congress themselves kept saying that, look, it's our election to lose. But you were so overconfident. And because it was being led by someone who's very resourceful, uh, who has a lot of uh, money at his disposal for the campaign, and is someone also who is very close to the Gandhi family. So what Rahul Gandhi decided was that he wasn't going to interfere that much with Kamal Nath's campaign. And even though there were warning signs from the beginning, because I spoke with people when the person in charge running the campaign was changed. So you had, you knew there were warning signs a couple of months ago when they changed J.P. Agarwal and they moved in Randeep Surjewala. And yet... They And why was that change done? It was because he wasn't listening to people. So however brilliant, um, I'm not sure how brilliant, uh, especially now, Kamal Nath is as a strategist, but however brilliant anybody is, you can't win a huge state like Madhya Pradesh if you don't take inputs from anyone. And the thing that you heard from the Congress throughout, uh, and they still thought they were overconfident enough about winning it, the thing was that they said that it's okay, we won't. So he didn't listen to anyone. Overconfidence in uh, Chhattisgarh, uh, well, it was, uh, they got inputs as well about how their ministers weren't doing well. You could make out how overconfident they were because uh, you could see that, for example, um, uh, the the cash uh, kind of assurances of giving 15,000 rupees to women and women, as we know right now, in retrospect, has been such a game changer for the BJP. They announced it after the first phase of polling was over. So they announced on the 11th of November, the first phase of sure. polling was 6th of November. So I, I think you know uh, what I mean, Milan. There are many issues, but I let I let the banker weigh in on that. So I think, you know, what surprises us about the elections is any any election has a, has a context that runs before it, right? As Sunetra said, uh, the BJP has been in power for 18 years in Madhya Pradesh. Um, it seems like Shivrat Singh Chauhan is struggling with uh, lots of anti-incumbency. It also seems like the BJP broadly across states wants to make a generational shift. So it wants to move away from Shivrat Singh Chauhan. So you're not sure how much input uh, the central leadership is giving them. Um, Kamal Nath, on paper, should have the sympathy that he won the last assembly election, uh, but was then removed after Jyotiraditya Sindhya moves over. 
So he's got no lingering anti-incumbency on the face of it. And just to remind our listeners, this was a big defection that took place on the Congress side. Yeah. One of their up-and-coming bright young leaders, uh, Mr. Cynthia, moved over to the BJP, which then precipitated a change of government. And the one thing that it did do in Madhya Pradesh, again for the Congress, in theory, was that it absolutely unified, it should have unified the state unit. Uh, if there were two very powerful leaders that were each fighting for their own uh, piece of flesh within the Congress uh, in 2018, which they won, um, that wasn't true anymore. Uh, so in theory, this should have been easy for the uh, this should have been easy for the Congress. Uh, it's very difficult in India for a chief minister to win after three consecutive terms or 18 years. That's baggage that very rarely has anybody come across. And the scale of the win shows you how how things were horribly wrong. Uh, so it seems to me like the Congress doesn't have feedback mechanisms between it, the ground and the state leadership, between the state leadership and the centre, and the centre and the ground. So for instance, if Kamal Nath has said, I am, as Sunitra said, I am taking over this election, there is either the central leadership can't tell something's going wrong, or if it can tell something's going wrong, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the, the heft to tell Kamal Nath something's wrong. Um, this scale is, I mean, it's it's shocking, uh, frankly. And in Chhattisgarh, the context to why this is, why this is actually so chastening, is that this is not a state. Uh, for all of Baghel's posturing, this is not a state that should have been a challenge. This is a state that elected a Thakur chief minister, which has they have Thakurs at one point five two percent of the population, um, for fifteen years, uh, very comfortably. Um, this is not a state that is really divided on caste lines, yet you played this OBC card to the hilt, which which only kind of controls the central part of rural Chhattisgarh. So it's a fundamental misreading of the state. There are two parts of that state that vote en masse, uh, and those are the two tribal regions. Uh, 14 seats in the, in the north, 12 seats in the south. When the Congress won so well in 2018, they won all 14 in the south, in the north. They have now lost all 14. So it's like a 28 vote swing, seat swing right there. So these misreadings uh, of the ground is what makes Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh, I mean, so difficult to swallow. Because I think fundamentally Rajasthan is a state that keeps shifting. So you would have perhaps forgiven Mr. Gelot for not coming over the line, though there are mistakes there as well. And they've done decently in Telangana. Uh, these two states make a difference in our in our headlines today. If you if they had done well in in Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, it would have been a completely different story. Even heading into into twenty twenty four, perhaps you'd see a modicum of some kind of hope uh, there. Um, yeah, and it's it's quite it's quite something. So, uh, Dibankar, I'm glad you mentioned Rajasthan. Maybe let's let's start there. As you said, this is one of those states that inevitably switches back and forth between the BJP and the Congress. So. For the Congress CM, Ashok Gillo, to triumph here would have been a breakthrough. And yet many watchers did think that it could be possible, given his own brand and his dedication to a plethora of welfare schemes, combined with the fact that the BJP didn't uh, project a chief ministerial face, which was a pretty controversial decision in some quarters. So, Nether, let me let me start with you. What, in the end, do you think was the Congress's downfall in Rajasthan? What was the kind of strategic mistake? Okay, I've thought about this and I've got down four uh, reasons why this happened. And you're spot on. It's something that was doable. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through those. One is, of course, the inability of the leadership to control their troops. Um, uh, for example, uh, you know, Ashok Gelot uh, had put up, it's very well known, people who were close to him. If they weren't given the tickets, they were fighting his independence. We know of various constituencies that happened. And of course, that was only meant to undermine Congress's own leadership. And the Congress knew this was happening. But basically, they said, well, OK, it's a loss in any case. We have low chances. So they didn't want to pick a fight or just didn't have the ability to pick a fight with him. So again, it was a redux of the time when the Congress wanted to install the next generation leader, Sachin Pilot. And of course, um, Ashok Gelo didn't let that happen. So that breakdown of trust, um, which really brings me to my second point, which is that you can't run an effective campaign. Either you're so strong at the center 
that the Congress leadership is so strong that they're able to, even if there is distrust between the state leadership and you, you are strong enough to make sure that your writ is carried out. There is huge distrust that we know in the Congress circles between the Gandhi family and even Malikarjun Kharge and Ashok Gehlot. Uh, this has happened since the entire that vote of confidence move happened and they were unable to have Ashok Gehlot replaced. Because of this um, distrust, you even had disagreements about who should run the campaign. Now, again, it comes back to the same thing. Ashok Gehlot is very good. He's been, of course, as you your viewers might know, he's been called a magician. It refers to the clan that he comes from. And he has done magic in uh, several times before. However, magicians also require the new tools that everyone from the BJP to all other parties are hiring. So he was told very clearly uh, about the number of people he needed to replace uh, he, of course, didn't do that. So a lot of the people who are associated with him, they didn't. Take, and he refused to take help from the Congress's new strategist who seems to have worked wonders in Telangana, Sunil Kanugulu. But he told Sunil Kanugulu that he didn't need his help. He preferred to go with his own strategist. So that's reason number two. Reason number three, of course, which we see playing out very clearly is the lack of alliance. I was speaking with the various people who are involved with the campaign, including Gaurav Gogoi, who was part of the team that came up with the, gave the tickets. And they admitted that if they had indeed allied with the left uh, or other India uh, party members, then they would have got some of the vote share, which they were able to get. So again, alliance was a huge factor in Rajasthan, because as we know, even in this, it's not a huge margin. Um, it's 112 seats, yeah. I think, is the final tally that the BJP has. So yeah. it is not, uh, you know, insurmountable. Uh, and finally, the other uh, particular thing is that the the both the leaders over there, I think everyone wanted a change of guard. So Ashok Gehlot knew he felt he had to protect his turf. And so he got blindsided by that. Many people pointed out the fact that Ashok Gehlot was so busy fighting these battles with the central leadership that he didn't start his campaign till it was very late. Yes, you have his main plank was fighting inflation. What people point out is you can't be the chief minister uh, and you can't be the incumbent and try to provide uh, and try to run your entire election on uh, inflation relief camps, which is what he was, it was called Mehengai Rahat Camp. Uh, that's for the opposition to do. He didn't really provide an answer to the BJP's attack about law and order or the BJP's attack about uh, having something uh, about the paper leak case. And so because he didn't have an answer, he didn't have a campaign, he got too late in passing out the tickets. It was, it was undone. That was his undoing. So, uh, the punker, we talked a little bit about Madhya Pradesh, and Sunetra talked about the numerous missteps that the Congress committed. Let me kind of frame the question a little bit differently, which is that, you know, we have a chief minister, Shivraj Singh Chauhan, who has occupied the chief minister's post for uh, almost two decades. Uh, and there was a feeling that the bite of anti incumbency could finally take him down. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, what was it do you think that he and by extension the BJP did right? What did they read perhaps in the tea leaves that allowed them to 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 circumvent this kind of ingrown anti-incumbency bias? Um, there are three things to this. The first is their the first is their political reading of danger. I think because they are connected to the ground, the red flags in the BJP go up much faster. So if you were to imagine a new imagine a conversation in amongst the BJP leadership, you would imagine a party that is constantly worried that they're going to lose and is therefore looking for ways to correct and improve all the time. You can imagine a cent the central leadership saying, you're not doing well here, you're not doing well here, we need to change this, we need to change that before an election, which is which is perhaps the correct way to go about it. In the Congress, I think the sense is that everybody keeps saying, oh, you know, we're winning. It's fine. We're doing okay. Uh, we don't need any inputs. We don't, like Sunetra said, we don't need help from Delhi. Uh, we've got all of these things naturally going for us. Uh, and, and therefore, there is no self-correction that happens. From what the 
BJP, I think, did over the last two, three months, our reporters are, were, were on the ground, is I think they juxtaposed two great images. Uh, one is Shivraj Singh Chauhan versus Kamal Nath. When you look at the political imagery that they use, uh, over the last three months, Shivraj Singh Chauhan went to rally after rally. And even what he was doing in those rallies was very interesting because he would take the mic to the stage, almost like this rock star, walk to the edge of the stage when he's with the crowd of people and come back. He's speaking directly to women. He's speaking directly to the people. I am a man of the people. Juxtapose that with Kamal Nath and Digvijay Singh. Digvijay Singh is an erstwhile uh, king of a small principality. Um, Kamal Nath, whenever he's speaking to people, you know, when, when there are lots of people around him and there's a crowd, he gets irritated. Uh, he's slightly crabby old man, so he's telling people off. His press conferences are speaking to the media. There is no accessibility with people. Um, and third, I think, because of that connection with people, you see Shivraj Singh Chauhan and the BJP actually fundamentally course correct. Uh, over the last 10 years, if there is a party that on it at the state level, even at the center, that has not been so that has not been so pro pro kind of laying out this welfare web, has been fiscally prudent. It has been the BJP. I think they've recognized that with multiple state governments now turning to this path. This is the way forward politically. And what Shivraj Singh Chauhan did with targeting women in his welfare web, with the Ladli Bena scheme, with this huge... Basically, I think if somebody were to take the BJP's manifesto and take a page each, there is a there is something for everyone. If you're a government servant, there is X. If you're a woman, there is X. They do that. There's that political theory from cradle to grave. So when you're born till the time you die, there is something for you. There is some money that the government is offering you. And the BJP has made the shift to that. So when the Congress has also, of course, made the shift to that, but it doesn't have the cadre on the ground to go and deliver that message to people. And there is a credibility with what, and there's an earnestness with how the BJP approaches people uh, and says, we need your vote. I am, particularly during elections, I am here for you. Uh, and I think the Congress kind of approaches elections to say, oh, you know, you've gone through 18 years of them. You need us. Uh, and just, just that fundamental difference in how they approach elections and that arrogance is is something that hurts them, I think, in an election. Uh, the Pankar, let me just stay with you and ask you about Chhattisgarh, because this is a state you know very well. You spent several years there as the Indian Express correspondent. The Congress was pretty confident about its ability to retain the state, uh, albeit have been. not by the same margin as 2018, but they thought that they would kind of squeak through. And, and as we were watching the returns yesterday, it looked like maybe they would, right? The early returns were quite positive. And then as the hours went by, <laughs> that graph came down and down and down. Um, uh, given your time in the state, uh, you weren't as surprised as some outsiders. Tell us why. Because for, um, there are, again, uh, two reasons. Number one is that I think anybody analyzing the 2023 results has to forget about 2018. This is a very young state. Uh, it's only been in, it's, it was only carved out of Madhya Pradesh in, in, in the year 2000, which means it's seen uh, now four assembly elections. Um, the first three assembly elections, where the BJP won with 50, 50 and 49 seats, there was a one and a half to two percent vote share gap. So fundamentally, it's a state where both parties are very strong. It's by by its nature, it's a close close run thing. Twenty eighteen was a unicorn. Was uh, you know fifteen years of Raman Singh. People are tired. Uh, I think everything has coalesced to a point where you know there's now a ten percent vote share gap. That cannot be your marker. So I think the Congress would have been smart to readjust in their imagination of how difficult the election would be to something the state has been for three of those four elections. That's number one. Number two, I think the reason I wasn't surprised was because I spent I spent four and a half years there between 2015 and 2019, which means I saw the start of this Congress government from Chhattisgarh. And it was like their imagination of Chhattisgarh was different to the previous 18, that 18 years that I'd ever seen. For 18 years, Chhattisgarh was told that it was a tribal state. Uh, there are above 30% tribals, both concentrated in two pockets, which means that when they vote, traditionally they vote together, uh, which is why you will always see tribal issues, Bastar, Maoism in the north, in the south, Sarguja in the north. These are places, if you win these, you win them together. So when the when 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 Congress wins Bastar, it wins nine of nine of twelve seats. 
uh, when the congressman Sargujat wins 14 of 14 altogether. Uh, the rural plains are, are seats that there is very difficult for there to be a sweep because it's it's like the Hindi heartland. Um, there are urban seats in between where the BJP is traditionally very strong and there are and there are castes like there are everywhere else. But Chhattisgarh does not, isn't a real, isn't a place that's very militant about caste, about voting on caste lines, which is why it's very difficult for you to have blocks of votes, blocks of seats. But we're at December 2018. Uh, there is this huge leadership struggle that's broken out. One of the reasons for that is that when they win 2018 with 68 seats, there's this perfect symmetry that happens where there are about three or four chief ministerial hopefuls. The Congress goes in with uh, no face. Uh, there is Mr. Singhdev in the North who says, I will be chief minister. So all of North Chhattisgarh votes for him. You have Mr. Tamrudat Sahu, who is an AICC member, who is the Sahu face, which is a very, which is, I think, the only caste that votes together, only OBC section that votes together. He could be chief minister, so the Sahus vote for him. Uh, Charandas Mahant, he could be chief minister, so they vote for him. And Mr. Baghel in the in the center. Um, so now Mr. Baghel is picked. And one of the reasons why he's picked, and apparently part of a two and a half year, two and a half year relation, seat sharing agreement with Mr. Singhdev, is because suddenly Chhattisgarh is an OBC state. And you have uh, Lok Sabha elections in six months. And the OBCs will take you through. But the OBCs aren't really a unified caste. So what happens in, in, May, in, in May 2019 is that after you won 68 of 90 in December, you win 2 of 11 in May 2019. That's where that argument should have rested. It should have been done. In fact, where the OBCs are strongest, which is Durg, the chief minister's constituency, they lose by 4 lakh votes. Uh, but they've persisted. So all of the Congress's pitch to the to the Chhattisgadi people is this Chhattisgadiya identity, uh, which is... Um, Mr. Mr. Baghel basically, you know, he'll, he'll stand out there with his hand and get whipped on his hand like it, it, there's a custom. The problem is that's a custom for about 25 seats in Chhattisgarh. No tribal knows what that is. Uh, no tribal speaks Hindi. So there are almost three different republics. And if you, do, if you cater to just one constituency, you're going to get results from that just one constituency. And you won't get those results because the Sahus have moved back. Um... So it just, it became became apparent that while he had created this image of him being the singular leader, he had also kind of trampled on, and I, I guess that's natural. There was a leadership crisis within the Congress and uh, somebody had to come out on top and there was a two and a half year agreement, but no political leader kind of gives that up. In that, in that effort, Mr. Singhdeo in the North stood completely diminished. One, because the leadership hadn't given him what he wanted to. Two, because among his people, they thought he didn't fight for them. Uh, his party workers didn't think he would fight for them. So in Sargoja, there's no message left. What do you tell the voter? Why are you voting for me? So they'll vote for the BJP. Mr. Sahu had lost complete relevance. He was home minister for five years, but didn't say anything. So the Sahus have moved back. So I thought actually the conditionalities were there for the, for the Congress to not win. And the funny thing is, I, I traveled in Chhattisgarh this election, and there was one telltale political sign of a crisis waiting to happen, which is every region you went, somebody told you, you know, the Congress is winning. They're just not winning here. So when you keep going, if the Congress is not winning here, and the Congress is not winning here, and the Congress is not winning here, where are they winning? And eventually, when, it, when the BJP has localized the election, that's when the numbers add up and you don't win. Hey, Grant the Marshall listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we've talked about several times now uh, in these various states is this, this issue of fatigue. And so, Sunetra, I want to ask you about Telangana, because this, of course, was the lone victory for the Congress. But it's also the state where you've had 10 years of rule by the BRS and KCR, uh, after which the voters have now unceremoniously uh, turned out him and his party. 
bringing the Congress to power in the state for the first time since it became a state back in 2014. And we were discussing this yesterday, I think. Um, you know, when you ask people, you know, how do you explain this? The, the, most of them say fatigue. People were just kind of tired and bored with KCR. Now, that seems almost too black and white and too simple. But do you think there is an element of truth in that? I think there was also, I mean, when I spoke with, I, I'll speak, you know, I'll quote some, I, I speak to political uh, politicians from all parties, but in this, they really had no stake in the game. I mean, the BJP never thought they would win. So, so a friend of mine who is uh, the BJP MP there, he said very clearly that, look, you know, I think the perception of uh, the TRS, the BRS being corrupt has actually really gone down to the ground. And he said that, we might do well if uh, we are able, if Kavita is uh, arrested and if the BJP can really distance itself from it. Otherwise, it's the Congress uh, which is going to really, really do well. Um, and I think that what's also interesting is that all of the things that we say that the BJP did right everywhere else, especially Madhya Pradesh. The thing is, I think, I think you know, one of these, I started out by saying, that you can't underestimate uh, the your opponent, and these are like these are not political kind of truisms. These are just general like how to live your life kind of truisms in sports as well. The other truism is, of course, that you know, work hard. You really got to work hard, right? And I and I think that every election kind of just drives home that simple point, and you see the politician who works really hard just does better. Yeah. So so how did Mamata get? so many seats and how did she get that amazing 2021 victory when BJP threw everything at them because she worked harder than them. She got herself in a wheelchair and went to every rally for a month in that wheelchair. You know what I mean? And the messaging was straight and she she knew what her messaging was and she worked hard to make sure it was there. How did the Congress win Telangana? They worked harder than the TRS or the BRS. They worked harder than KCR. I think one of the things that people have been saying about KCR is the same thing that people said about Amrinder Singh in Punjab, that he was a chief minister who wasn't seen well, he wasn't all over the place, he wasn't himself, he wasn't speaking like he would. I think all of these charismatic leaders, if they lose their connection with the people, you know, there isn't. The people don't want to pass that on to their children. Uh, and we've seen that in several cases across. And what the Congress was able to do over here, which they obviously didn't think necessary in Madhya Pradesh or in Rajasthan or in Chhattisgarh, is that they started working on it a year or more, two years in advance. They figured out, there was a whole leadership there. They figured out, I think, more than a year before that that leadership wasn't working. They needed to change them. So you had a complete change of the team that was there in Telangana from the Congress side. They put them in there. They made sure that they had modern tools of uh, uh, elections, which is why I think that this Sunil Kanagalu, he tried to help the other states here because there was no big ego. Everybody was new. They listened to him uh, and they played this. So they... They kind of, uh, they had lots of welfare schemes. And we know, of course, going by the various other instances, the BJP's playbook, that welfareism works in India, especially when, when you have distress in many areas, then welfareism works. And so uh, the Congress was able to impress upon people that they had a narrative. They had people who worked hard. And obviously, Revanth Reddy is a face who worked for the people. They found him an attractive... Uh, option. And that that's what we're seeing there. So this is going to be kind of a difficult question uh, to answer, perhaps, um, about the Congress, given everything both of you have said. I mean, obviously, today, they're sort of licking their wounds, right? I mean, these losses were, were deeply uh, felt. Uh, they had hoped to limit the BJP's gains to maybe one state at most. Um, can I ask uh, either of you, or both of you, if you were looking for a silver lining is there one for the Congress? If they're trying to find some straw to grasp onto after these three losses, what would it be? Okay, if I have to go first, I would say one, they have a talent pool. You know they have a talent pool because you saw that at work in uh, in Karnataka. You saw some of that talent. So you have people like who are great organizers, 
like DK Shivakumar. He's of course been flown into Telangana. Of course, many people would just dismiss him as someone who's got great resources. He's got lots of funds, and so he's able to fund an election. But he's also, when I speak with Congress workers, they talk about the fact that he's able to convey a leadership which would have people, which, which kind of um, motivates the workers. So. Uh, there are many others like him as well. I think it's in Madhya Pradesh as well. You have all these untapped leadership, um, a lot of young leaders that the Congress has, like Jitu Patwari and others, who are who uh, many people feel can make a change. So one, they have a pretty good bench strength. The other thing, of course, is that Malik Arjun Kharge, in some ways, many people feel the best thing that the Congress did for itself was to ensure that the Gandhis weren't anywhere near the top of the leadership, that Malik Arjun Kharke became Congress president. Um, it may not look so with the 3-0 wipeout in the heartland, but as soon as he came in, he won two elections. That was uh, Himachal Pradesh and Karnataka and Telangana as well. The only thing perhaps that others would say, and I would agree as well, is that Malik Arjun Kharge should stop being the kind of consensus builder that he is right now and go by his own instincts. I don't think that it would, he has the political capital and the kind of goodwill with the, and the trust of the Gandhis that if he made a few calls, that they would oppose him. So at this time, he needs to take more of those calls instead of just trying to make everyone happy. So these two things are perhaps things that they really have going for them. I think it's a very, very, very dim silver lining. Uh, <laughs> it will look very hard uh, because it does look bleak. I think, uh, the, I mean, the, the the scary part about for the Congress about the Hindi heartland is you were, el- you were anyway looking at a, at the UP which has 80 seats where you have no presence. You have Gujarat, you have no presence. It feels like now Madhya Pradesh uh, is almost as irre as 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 difficult as these other two states so it does look hard um but stranger things have happened in politics and one of the things that i think might end up being good for the congress is that is that in many ways in lots of ways in life chastenings are good uh it, it they kind of break hubris um so i think the, before this the congress had this after karnataka they had this one imagination of themselves is rising and therefore the India Alliance members had to coalesce around them and they were the party that were going to get above 100, 120 seats and everybody else must play second fiddle and the other regional parties didn't want that. Uh, It's a very difficult ask, but the only way actually that the India Alliance can even conceivably come together is that that if there is a, and arrive at a seat sharing agreement across, across states, is if the Congress were to sit at the table as equals and not this big brother in... And the funny thing is, if you were to imagine that, again, imagine that negotiation at the table, in Bihar, the Congress has nothing. But the Congress was entering those conversations in Bihar saying, oh, look, you know, we've got 20 seats in Madhya Pradesh or 20 seats in Gujarat. Therefore, we must we must get more. Now you don't have them. So that regional member is going to tell you, look... Take your five seats that you can win and leave us the other 35. If they were to come together, that's still a political challenge for the BJP to counter. Because the more they localize an election, particularly in states where castes are important like Bihar or in other places, it gets more and more, uh, it gets more and more complicated. Uh, the other thing that is a that is a little bit of a silver lining is I think that if you look at uh, Telangana, for instance, they've got Andhra votes with uh, Andhra votes with the with the national elections. Andhra is the neighboring state. It does feel like at least in that region the Congress is rising. There are 19 seats, Lok Sabha seats up for grabs in in Telangana. Hopefully the Congress can put itself as an opposition there. The only danger I think for the Congress even there, and I think they have to spot it quickly, is that even in 2018, whether Cong- whether whether TRS had won 88 seats or close to 100 seats of 119. In the Lok Sabha elections, the BJP won four. Now the BJP has got 14% of the vote. And there will be lots of voters that will say, what is the point of voting for the BRS? So the moment that election becomes polarized, national elections becomes polarized between the Congress and the BJP, you can also imagine a universe where the BJP rises in Telangana and Andhra. Uh, But in these options, as long as the Congress is in the conversation, 
there is, I mean, it's never done. There's no point. There is actually no point for the Congress to, like us as commentators, sit here and go, we can go, oh, you know, the election's done in six months. What's the point? Uh, as Modi said yesterday, you can almost write the script already. If the Congress were to do that, then it really is done. If the Congress were to feel like, okay, here is, it is at this point now where we kick out the old guard, bring in new people, uh, fill it with new narratives, find a way to connect to the ground, and importantly, talk to our allies in, in, in cogent ways that don't insult them, uh, there is perhaps a small pathway back. Well, I mean, I would just add, add maybe another one. I mean, in these three states, you guys will know the numbers better than I, but, um, you know, the Congress got or got close to 40 percent of the vote, right? So still, you know, despite whatever challenges you may have, four out of 10 uh, voters still decided that the Congress was good So enough, I saw a right? Congress leader tweet that if this, if these percentages were to hold, it means they win 20 Lok Sabha seats in all of these, in these three states, across these three, four states. Which would be a good number in your mind or a bad number? number? It'd be a terrible number. <laughs> it'd be a better number. Um, Sinatra, obviously the question everybody is asking the day after is, you know, what does this mean for the 2024 race, right? And... I mean, in some ways, I guess this could be a very short answer, which is, well, it means that the party that we thought that was in pole position is even better positioned than and than we thought. Um, is the BJP, do you think, going to take their foot off the accelerator because they're sitting much more comfortably today than they were just 24 hours ago? I don't think they ever take their foot off the <laughs> accelerator. Yeah. Uh, that's that's really how they do it. Um, this goes back to the hard work uh, that you were mentioning earlier. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I think I think that the BJP also has various lessons that uh, they have learned in the last year. The only thing is that it looks like most of the times that they are picking up those lessons, whereas the Congress isn't learning those lessons. And one of the things that perhaps that we can take from this is that the BJP should have learned by now that one size doesn't fit all. So I think the attempt right from the beginning of this year was to go on to the next guard and fresh faces, right? Um, and it's uh, BJP's classic way of getting rid of anti-incumbency. Um, and yet the lesson that they've learned, especially in this election and the Karnataka elections is, yes, you can do that in Rajasthan. They have successfully phased out um, Vasundhara Raje, but you can't do that in Madhya Pradesh. And you certainly didn't do that in Karnataka. So, so a really interesting lesson about how to uh, change, go over to the next generation. And I think the BJP perhaps, you know, that's something that they're having trouble with. And we're going to see now in the selection of their chief ministers just how, how they play that out. The other thing that perhaps uh, the Congress, uh, and which I'm really excited about seeing is what kind of story that they have for 2024. Now, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I was talking to people is, is there a rethink about this entire issue about the OBC census? Um, we know that the BJP is, uncom even though it looks like they're really comfortable uh, right now. They've done really well in the Hindi heartland. But we know that they are really uncomfortable about gauging with this idea. So I think the exciting thing and I think the unknown thing is because I don't think anyone is putting it down to a failure of the pitch of the caste census being blaming that for the Congress's loss. So it's interesting to see whether the Congress or the opposition sticks to this as the narrative or whether they'll be forced to come up with a with a better or a much more kind of um, uh, a narrative or a story as the opposition, which will, uh, you know, draw people in or draw voters in more. So uh, these are two things which I think are things which would surprise mm -hmm. and which you know, which are perhaps otherwise, of course, you know, we can all say that it's going to be three years, uh, you know, like Modi said, we are going to hear him speak in the next uh, 15th August speech as well. But I think like uh, like uh, Dipankar said, the unknown and every I think one constant that we have every election is that we always say, oh, my God, we never saw that coming, you know. Uh, the bunker, before I sort of ask you both to reflect on sort of next steps of the opposition, let me just 
ask you a specific questions about the Congress because you and I spoke for this show several months ago about uh, the Rahul Gandhi's Bharat Jodo Yatra. And one of the things we debated at the time was whether or not this, you know, pretty significant exercise was going to have a long term impact for the Congress Party organization as a whole. We've now had 10 or so months uh, of, of, of time which has elapsed to kind of reflect on this. You're shaking your head. Uh, does that mean that there hasn't really been a sustained impact from this effort? So I remember one of the things that we did say even then was that great effort. Uh, India hasn't seen it before. Worked for Rahul Gandhi. For it worked for the Congress, but it was step one of five. Uh, for it to be... For it to work, it had to mean you got your states right. You continued to do this for another uh, more time. You got it. It's it's a force multiplier. It cannot be your campaign. Uh, so in Telangana, for instance, I you know one of the things that I'm seeing right now is a lot of congressmen desperate to kind of attribute the Telangana win to the Bharat Jodo Yatra, and it's one of ten reasons. It is the beginning of perhaps it's the beginning of how Revan Reddy you know of those crowds meant something. But the but the funny thing with the Congress is it just feels like they if I it feels like a really really cheap car that keeps stuttering and stops, but it has to keep moving. So the notion that Rahul Gandhi was an entitled person, or you know, as the BJP used to call him, quote unquote Papu, broke for a while when he's gone and put so much physical rigor across the country. But when you lose three states, two of states that you're meant to win, and you go campaign in them rigorously, right now, if he doesn't course correct again, uh, for the next six months, you, the BJP is already back to calling him somebody that is politically useless. So the so the Bharat Jodo Yatra is a force multiplier. It does add an element of rigor to the Congress campaign. It adds the notion that they do want to work hard, but it happened once. It happened so long ago. Um... Uh, and it doesn't help all of these other mistakes that we've that we've spoken of. If you've got a great campaign, a good leader, then the Bharat Jodo Yatra sure is going to help you be one factor to say, look, even your central leadership is working hard for people, but it cannot do anything by itself. So I just want to add to that because, you know, I, I've been thinking about this, about how pe- Congress's refusal to learn lessons. And I think yeah. that we have one instance right in front of us in this election. I was thinking this morning, Digvijay Singh, Right. When was the last time he did any good for the party? Right. I mean, when the UPA was in power, his comments about Sonia Gandhi crying for uh, the terrorists Mm. or his comments have always been a source of embarrassment or controversy. I really can't as an objective reporter or a journalist or an editor covering or looking at the at the political lives of the Congress party, I cannot honestly think of one substantial thing he's done since 2004, since Rahul Gandhi came. And yet Rahul Gandhi continues to be loyal to him and he continues to get uh, great positions. And we know that it was his delay uh, in Goa in the uh, in the election for last. So that's like the 2014 one. Um, you know, not the last election, previous one. It was him dilly-dallying, which cost them the entire government. Allowed the BGP to, he to like, sweep in. He continues to do that. And yet, now, now, if they actually, you know, fire him after this, then perhaps we know that the Congress is learning. If they don't, then we don't. And let me give you an example of how the BJP does it. Kailash Vijayvargya, who finally won his election in Madhya Pradesh yesterday, he made one mistake. He was the closest thing to Amit Shah's team. He was part of the BJP General Secretary. He got the plum assignment of being in charge of West Bengal. They lost so badly and we saw him being punished in front of our eyes. He didn't have any assignment yeah. and it wasn't just him. But it was also the unfortunate thing about his son behaving badly, which also didn't give him do him any credit. But he was punished so much that he didn't get any assignment. He was made to contest. He was made to get a demotion, as we like to call it in India. That he was made to go back to electoral politics, go fight an MLA election. And now he's won. So you see someone, 21, and this is three years later, he's still being punished. And finally, maybe he'll get some. So this is the difference between the BJP, where you're instantly you're made to be accountable, and the Congress. I think, you know, it says it all. 
So uh, let me just kind of wrap this up by asking you one final question uh, about the Opposition Alliance, which has this, some would say clever, some would say not so clever uh, acronym, India. Um, They've announced that they will be meeting on December 6th to discuss next steps in their attempts to build a coherent alliance. Um, As December 6th rapidly approaches, what will you be looking for as, you know, we're going to have leaders of some two dozen parties uh, converge in Mumbai. So, Netra, how will we know if this is for real or not? I I remember uh, Mamta Banerjee having Rahul Gandhi sit next to her, um, even though she's never traditionally been uh, very fond of him. But fresh from Bharat Joro Yatra, she said, everyone's favorite Rahul Gandhi. That's what she said. And that just showed the importance that the Congress was getting after the Bharat Joro Yatra. I think the Congress has also been um, very vain. They've refused to talk to anyone till the elections were done because they were hoping that they would come home with a huge tally of wins, which hasn't happened. So perhaps uh, what we can expect, and I'm looking forward to seeing the new dynamics play out post the election electoral results, and perhaps Congress will accept it and let the regional players who've done very well, let them work out and do what's best. So I have a a friend of mine in in Chhattisgarh who's quite close to politics, is actually an ardent listener of your show, um, who made the point to me about a week ago that, you know, one of the things Rahul Gandhi keeps saying is that we have opened a shop of love, which is that in a marketplace of hate, I've opened a shop of love. But I think He said that what was crucial for the Congress and the India Alliance to figure out is what it was selling in that shop. Um, I think the HT data team did a great story today, uh, which is very telling, which is that since 2014, the Congress has failed to retain a single state where it has come to power. What that means is, I think they look at power as an end. Once they arrive at that position, there is no imagination of what that state must be, of what its politics should be. Um, And that kind of finds its way in the campaign as well. So I think, you know, while they're sifting through these myriad narratives, and I think narrative is a very dangerous word for the Congress, Mm -hmm. because to the people, it seems like you're trying to find one way of getting our vote. You don't really believe in anything. So they've gone from soft Hindutva visiting temples to militant, to to, to proper secularism, to say that, you know, the BJP is, you know, uh, disenfranchising Muslims, uh, to now the caste census, to OBCs. And I think they keep shifting once every three, four months, and there is no sustained idea of what the Congress or the opposition believes in. And the, and the problem with that is that even if the India Alliance were to come together, even if the India Alliance, for instance, they say the biggest sticking point is finding uh, finding a way forward for a candidate, one candidate across all parties to face the BJP. The problem is, say you go past that huge hurdle, that candidate is going to go to the people. When he goes to the people, what is he going to say? What do you stand for? Fundamentally, what are the four things you are offering to the people as an idea of what the country will be from 2024 to 2029, which is simply that the country will not be ruled by Narendra Modi? Apart from the fact that we are not the BJP, who are you? What are you selling? Uh, Why should someone vote for you? The problem is we keep focusing, and I think the the, the opposition keeps saying things like, and it's true, uh, of the capture of investigative agencies, of the media, and all of that. That is, sure, a problem, a challenge in political communication. Step one of political communication is knowing what to say. And whether that message in itself, that first fundamental message is powerful for people. And if you don't know that, and if it's so scattered, because you've got so many uh, multiple parties in this in this coalition, you're going to run into the obvious problem, which is um, the Congress believes X in Himachal Pradesh, but your alliance partner in Tamil Nadu is saying X. Uh, the Congress means is saying something in Rajasthan, but in Assam, the same guy who's fighting the, the, on, on the same India Alliance ticket is saying Y. So they've got to somehow go and distill their message to India in five coherent ways or in five coherent themes. And if they can do that, maybe they have a sliver of a chance, but they need to do that first. My guests on the show this week are Sunetra Choudhury. She is the political editor of the Hindustan Times and Dipankar Ghosh, who serves as HC's deputy national editor. I know it was a very late night in the newsroom. I think it was still populated past midnight. I uh, appreciate you coming into the office early today and joining me on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. 
Grand Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HT Smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. To stay updated on this podcast, follow us at HD Smartcast on all the major social media platforms. To listen to more such podcasts, log on to www.hdsmartcast.com. Smartcast.com.